Hello, and welcome to part seven of our lecture series on the urinary system. And in this lecture, we're going to take a look at the ureters, the bladder, urinary bladder, and the urethra. So again, if we take a look at the kind of gross anatomical structures within the kidneys, uh, we focused in on uh, essentially the, the filtering mechanism and the mechanism involved with establishing our, our urine whether uh, in the presence of ADH, uh, we're producing a relatively small volume of highly concentrated urine, or in the absence of ADH, uh, or in the presence of a, a diuretic factor, we're producing a, a large volume of relatively dilute urine. Basically, what's gonna happen is we're gonna be dumping the urine into uh, our renal sinuses, uh, into uh, essentially the spaces which are going to um, in essence, funnel the blood into the number seven and number six on this diagram, uh, filter it into uh, our ureters. Uh, if we take a look at the mucosal lining of our renal calyces and renal pelvis, this is where we're gonna start to see our transitional epithelia being present. Uh, a transitional epithelia, uh, many cell layers thick, um, so we're gonna have a, a stratified epithelia. So it's gonna help establish an osmotic barrier. And so it's gonna prevent uh, materials from passing through it so that it doesn't dilute the urine that we've spent so much time and, and physiological mechanisms involved in, in creating, uh, as well as it doesn't uh, expose the surrounding tissues to that very hypertonic urine, because that very high concentration of materials uh, has the potential of dehydrating that region, uh, drawing water out of it, and damaging the cells in that area. Uh, if we take a look at this, um, an adventitia uh, is gonna be surrounding the this renal uh, pelvis, the renal calyces, uh, blending into uh, the fat cells that are gonna be surrounding it. Ultimately though, we're going to drain the renal pelvis into uh, the urinary bladder, and we're gonna transport the urine through the ureters. And so this is gonna be a structure still lined by uh, a transitional epithelia, uh, lined by a stratified epithelia, which is gonna be carrying the urine without modifying it, without uh, exposing underlying tissues to it uh, into the urinary batter, bladder. Uh, it's gonna look very similar to our renal pelvis, uh, but if we take a look at the wall, uh, we're gonna be surrounded by a muscularis. Uh, and in this case, different from what we've got within the digestive system, we're gonna have an inner longitudinal layer of smooth muscle and an outer circular layer of smooth muscle. And again, this is different from what we've seen uh, in the digestive system. In the digestive system, we have an inner circular and outer longitudinal. In the urinary system, we've got an inner longitudinal and an outer circular layer of our smooth muscle. We take a look at the ureter wall. As uh, we get closer and closer to the bladder, our ureter wall is gradually going to be thickened, and ultimately, it's going to go continuously into the urinary bladder uh, where that muscularis is going to be continuous with the muscularis which is going to be surrounding our, uh, our urinary bladder. We take a look at the urinary bladder again it's going to be a distensible muscular sac meaning that um, we can uh, essentially inflate this bladder as it fills with urine. We're going to be lined by a transitional epithelium again so it's a stratified epithelium uh, nucleated cells uh, along the surface, uh, dome-shaped cells along the surface as opposed to kind of the flattened cells that we would see in a minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelia in areas like uh, the digestive tract uh, or the vagina. Uh, if we could take a look at these transitional epithelial cells uh, with electron microscopy, uh, we're going to see fusiform vesicles. Uh, these are vesicles which are essentially membrane-bound structures which can fuse with our apical uh, plasma membrane and in essence increase the amount of surface area that's available so it allows these cells to stretch a little bit further. Underlying this transitional epithelia like we've got underlying most uh, or all epithelia, uh, we're going to have a lamina propria and then deeper to that we're going to have a very thick uh, muscularis with smooth muscle cells ultimately in, in many different orientations. Again, keep in mind that what you've got with the urinary bladder as a muscular sac is that you want to be able to stretch and fill, but when it's time to void the bladder, you want to be able to constrict that as much as possible to completely uh, compress down 
uh, on the urinary bladder and empty it as, as much as possible. Um, still, within the muscularis, we're going to have an involuntary internal sphincter or smooth muscle sphincter, uh, which is going to close off uh, the opening between the urinary bladder and our urethra. Uh, so again, uh, to essentially regulate the flow of, of material uh, urine from our urinary bladder uh, to our urethra. If we take a look at the urethra, again, that's going to be uh, the tube that runs from the bladder to the external for voiding the bladder for getting it, uh, essentially emptying it to, for removing the urine, uh, excreting the urine from a waste product, uh, removing it from the body. Uh, it's going to be lined by a stratified squamous epithelium, although in some patches you may find a, a pseudostratified columnar epithelium, and this may be uh, associated with uh, pathologies associated with it or at least damage to the epithelial lining. Uh, well-developed venous plexus within the mucosal wall uh, of the female urethra and then external uh, towards the, the tip of the urethra is going to be a voluntary external sphincter. Uh, so it's voluntary, so it's going to be a skeletal muscle sphincter, uh, which is going to be surrounding it, allowing for kind of volitional control to kind of prevent the urine uh, from leaking out of the urethra. Again, within the female urethra, it's going to be a relatively short tube that's going to run from the bladder to the exterior kind of anatomically. In contrast, the male urethra uh, is going to be much longer than the female urethra. Uh, anatomically, it's going to run kind of the same location, but it's going to run through then through the tip of the, the penis. Uh, and it's going to be used uh, for a combination of uh, urinary passage, uh, release of the waste materials within the urine, as well as involved with uh, the reproductive tract uh, because it's going to be involved with carrying the sperm. Uh, the external sphincter is going to be located uh, in about a first third of the male urethra. And what we're going to see is that the epithelial lining uh, of the male urethra is going to run from a transitional epithelia to a stratified or pseudostratified columnar to ultimately uh, the stratified squamous epithelia. Within uh, the wall of the male urethra, especially within the penis, uh, we'll find glands of liter, uh, litra. Uh, and these are mucus secreting glands which have the effect of neutralizing the urine uh, so that it doesn't damage the sperm cells uh, that may be passing through this shared passageway. That finishes up our, our overview associated with uh, the ure ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra. Uh, we'll have one additional lecture uh, within the series, part eight, where we're going to review some of the important concepts associated with the urinary system. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu.